So in the next video in our series on building a circuit on a physical breadboard based on a circuit diagram, we will take a look at operational amplifiers or this triangle symbol here. So we are getting a little more advanced. This is something you might typically encounter in an undergraduate electronics lab, probably not in high school. And this is one of the first parts that tends to confuse people because the physical symbol for the part really looks nothing like the actual physical part. It even seems at first glance like the number of pins doesn't even match. So opposed, as opposed to simple parts like a resistor where the symbol has two terminals and then the physical resistor also has two terminals, it's kind of hard to look at this and figure out what exactly how that relates to the symbol. So we're going to talk about that before we start building the circuit. But before that, we're going to go over a lot of jargon that you might encounter when building circuits. In particular, this op amp is in a dual inline package. It's an integrated circuit that is designed for through hole mounting as opposed to surface mount mounting. So that, that is a lot of jargon and kind of an alphabet soup of acronyms. So we're going to go through those before we start building the circuit. So here's a three dimensional view of a physical op amp. And you see that this is an integrated circuit as opposed to a discrete component like a resistor or a capacitor. Integrated circuit meaning it is a circuit that actually has a bunch of circuit components like resistors, capacitors, transistors, and things all on one chip that is then encapsulated in this plastic package. Now integrated circuits come in different shapes and sizes. This particular one you'll be working with today is a dual inline package, meaning the package has these two rows of legs that, as you will see, are spaced to fit nicely across this middle gap of the breadboard, which avoids shorting the pins on opposite sides together. Through hole, meaning it has these long legs, let's magnify this picture here, that are designed to get mounted through holes on a circuit board. They also work well with a solderless breadboard. That is in contrast to surface mount technology where the parts just fit flat on top of the circuit board and don't go through holes in the circuit board. So you can't use these with a breadboard. So again, that's a lot of acronyms. In integrated circuit is IC. Dual inline package is DIP. Through hole, we usually refer to plated through holes or PTH. And then surface mount can either be SMT for surface mount technology or SMD for surface mount device. So you might have to jot those down or make yourself a vocabulary list if you haven't heard all those terms before. But today, we're just going to be working with this op amp. I'm just going to call it an op amp, but it is an integrated circuit in a dual inline package. So let's start by talking about the op amp symbol and what exactly all of the connections are. So the basic op amp symbol only shows three connections. We have two inputs, the negative and positive input. You may also hear these referred to as the inverting and non-inverting input. And then we have one output. But clearly we're missing some stuff there because if we look at the physical op amp over here, we see it has eight pins. So something that is usually not drawn in the main diagram just to save space is that op amps do require an external power supply, not just a single voltage, but a positive and a negative voltage when referenced to ground. So ground is zero volts. We're gonna have positive 15 volts, which is above ground and negative 15 volts, which is below ground. That is still only five pins. So we're gonna need to go look up the data sheet for this part to figure out what exactly all those other pins are. And as usual, if you mouse over the pins in Tinkercad, it does tell you what they are. We see in this case, we have two additional offset pins in addition, and then a not connected pin, just because these integrated circuits are symmetric, so they don't make them with seven pins, and for the eighth pin, there's just one there that's not connected. But if you're working with a physical kit, there's no mouse over tooltip to tell you what the pins are, so you need to pull up the parts data sheet for that. So... We can see here the data sheet for the 741 operational amplifier, which is what we have in Tinkercad. Again, here's that circuit diagram showing a typical application, which is actually what we're going to be building today, where we have that negative and positive input, positive and negative supply, and then the output. But to see what the other pins are, we need to scroll down to the diagram that shows the physical package. And again, these do come in different shapes. There's also a circular package available. We are going to be using the rectangular one, where again, we have those two offset pins, which we are not going to be using today. So we're just going to leave those disconnected. And then this eighth pin up here that is not connected. Now notice I'm going to zoom in a bit here. The numbering of these pins starts in the top left and goes counterclockwise. So down one side and then up the other side. And this is important that does not necessarily correspond to the physical 
order of the pins on these circuit diagrams. So for example, here I do have the inverting input and not inverting input, and then my negative input, but then I've got this offset pin, which I'm not showing, sorry, negative power, then the offset pin, which is not shown on the diagram, and then the output. So these do kind of match if I start here and go um, counterclockwise, but these offset pins are not shown on this diagram. So in general, don't assume things are in the same order on a symbol as they are on the physical part. You need to go check the data sheet and see what the pins are labeled just in case the physical orientation does not match up. So we've covered all of that background information. Let's get to the part where we are actually building the circuit. Now, there are a ton of different applications for op amps. I have just picked a simple one as an example today. We're going to be building a non-inverting amplifier which takes an input voltage and amplifies it at the output according to this equation, which depends on these two resistor values. So I've just picked the same value for both of these resistors. So the quantity in the parentheses here will be two and the output voltage should be double the input voltage. So to build the circuit, again, with these dual inline packages, they are designed to straddle the gap in the middle of a breadboard. So remember how a breadboard is connected. The holes in each row on one side are connected to each other as highlighted here in Tinkercad, but they are not connected across this gap. So number one mistake you can make when using an IC in a DIP package, remember your acronyms, don't do this because then you are just shorting those pins together. It needs to be straddling the gap in the middle of the breadboard. Number two, big mistake you can make, don't put it upside down. If you look at the physical chip closely, you will usually see a notch and or a dot on one side that indicates the top. So if you go look at the data sheet, again, the top, the pin number one is in the top left and then the pins go counterclockwise from there. So if you flip that, technically that is fine. You could still wire the circuit correctly like this. You just also need to remember to flip this diagram upside down so you don't get all of the pins reversed. So to me, it makes a lot more sense to have it upright like this so it's in the same orientation as the breadboard writing and then everything on the data sheet is aligned as well. Be very careful because if you get it upside down, that is an easy way to get some weird short circuit behavior and fry your op amp. So I would recommend building your circuit around the op amp since this is the most complex component in the circuit and kind of starting with that and connecting everything else to it according to the diagram. So let's do the resistors next since those are nice simple parts. And then we'll worry about all of the additional external connections and talk about how those are inferred from the diagram here. So I have two 10 kilo ohm resistors. One is going to go from the inverting input to ground. So double check here. There is my inverting input. Again, here I can cheat and mouse over in Tinkercad, but if you're not using Tinkercad, you need to go look at the data sheet to see which one is the inverting input. And I am just gonna connect one of my resistors from that inverting input to the ground bus on my breadboard, which I'll be using for ground later. The next resistor is going to go from the inverting input over to the output. So here's my inverting input. There is my output. And if you're doing this on a physical breadboard, you might just have the resistor kind of go over the op amp like this because real resistors have longer leads that are kind of flexible that spacing doesn't really work out that well in tinkercad so what i'm going to do instead is i'm going to put my resistor up here and i'm going to run jumper wires to my resistors so again i want to get here from my inverting input to this resistor and then down to the output so i have a path for current from here remember how breadboard rows work these are in adjacent holes in the same row so they are connected over here and down to there. And again, if you were doing this with a physical resistor, you wouldn't really need the jumper wires. You could just make it go over top of the op amp, although then that's kind of annoying when you want to remove the op amp, the resistor is in the way. So it's kind of a matter of how you physically want to arrange things on the breadboard, but there are multiple physical ways to do something that are electrically equivalent. Okay, I have now connected the resistors. Let's talk about all of the external connections. Now, it doesn't explicitly say it in this diagram. It says V in and V out, but it doesn't really say what those are. So normally, for example, if you're doing this in an electronics lab, V in is going to come from something like a function generator and V out would then be measured by an oscilloscope. Similarly, I have plus or minus 15 volts here, but doesn't explicitly say what I'm using to power those. That's probably going to be something like a benchtop power supply all of those need to be referenced to the same common ground. So all of the voltages are referenced to the same zero level. So next we're gonna show how we bring in all of these external laboratory equipment connections. 
So I've lined up all of the equipment I'm going to need here in Tinkercad. I have my function generator and oscilloscope and two benchtop power supplies because it does not have a single supply that can produce both negative and positive voltages. So we're going to have to do that by chaining two of these together, which I'll explain in a minute. First, let's look at the function generator and the oscilloscope. So remember, all of these need to be referenced to the same common ground. So I am going to connect the ground of my function generator and the ground of my oscilloscope all to the ground bus on my breadboard before I get to do that. Forget to do that. And then we're going to look at where the positive terminals from these are going to go. So the function generator positive terminal is going to be my V in to the non inverting terminal of the op amp. And I can mouse over to see that that is this input here. So I'm going to run a wire from the positive terminal of my function generator to the positive or non inverting input of my op amp. And I have now made this connection. Again, the ground connection is not shown in this diagram. When you just label a voltage like this V in and V out, it is implied that they are referenced to ground. And most circuits, at least the ones that we're dealing with, are just going to have a single ground for the circuit. Similarly, for the oscilloscope, it is going to be used to measure V out. So I need to find the output pin on my op amp, which is over here and run a wire from the positive terminal on the oscilloscope over to the output pin of my op amp. So now I have now connected both my V in and my V out, but I have not connected power to my op amp yet. So remember, if you just hook up your function generator in your oscilloscope and try to run the circuit because you were just going off this diagram, nothing's going to happen. These plus and minus power connections are usually not shown in the op amp diagram. It's just implied that you need them and they're left out to keep things a little neater. So you're building an op amp circuit. Don't forget to connect the power. So we still need to connect the power to our power minus and power plus pins. And this might be a little easier if you are working with a benchtop supply that has ground positive and negative voltage terminals. Again, Tinkercad does not have that. So what we are going to do is chain these two power supplies together in series. So we're going to run the negative terminal of one to the positive terminal of another. And that's going to give us a positive output on this end and a negative output on this end, assuming we use the middle terminal as ground. So I'm going to connect my ground to that middle terminal on both of them. So actually, I'm going to make this wire black. So again, middle terminal is ground here. That is going to give me plus 15 volts out over here negative 15 volts out over here. So and now my wiring is going to get a little tricky and you'll have to think of what exactly you want to do with your breadboard power buses. So this breadboard only has plus and minus symbols. I've already decided to use the minus one for ground or zero volts, but I haven't connected it over to the left side here. So for example, I could decide if I want negative 15 volts easily available everywhere to run it to here. But then you need to be very careful and remember not to connect your two ground buses, because if you do that, you're shorting ground to negative 15 volts. So if you don't want to do that, for example, I could just run this directly to where I need it on the op amp. I have my negative power input down there. I could run this all the way over there. And now I've just sent negative 15 volts directly to that input on the op amp. Similarly, if I want to do positive 15 volts, I could run that to my power bus here. And now I'm going to have positive 15 volts available on this whole bus. And if I want that available over on this side of the breadboard, I could also run it over here. Whoops. And then connect the positive power pin on the op amp directly to that bus. Alternatively, I could skip that process and just go directly from plus 15 volts here to the power plus on the op amp. So normally it's better to use the buses when you're working your breadboard. But again, when you're using positive and negative voltage supplies and ground, so you really have three voltages here and a breadboard with only two buses, you need to be really careful or sorry, two labels for the buses. You need to be really careful about how you're connecting them and then you're not shorting the different things together. So this is a little messy because of how I had to arrange things in Tinkercad here. If you were building a circuit with multiple op amps and you needed power plus and minus 15 volts more easily available everywhere. It's probably a good idea to do use the buses, but again, be careful not to short them together. 
So especially when working with op amps, it is a really good idea to double check all of your wiring before powering everything on. These are probably one of the most common components that students destroy in a college level electronics class. So for example, I'm gonna take the op amp out of the equation there completely and I've hooked up multimeters to make sure I have my power supplies wired correctly. So when I run this, you see I have each of these set to 15 volts individually, but again, the way I have them chained together in series, I am getting positive 15 volts coming out of this one and negative 15 volts reference to ground coming out of this one. So I'm going to stop that. I'm sure my power supplies are correct. Go ahead and drop my op amp back in place. Make sure I put it in the right place. So there, power plus is connected over to power. Start my simulation. And you can see that I have my input function generator set to a five volt amplitude here. So what I would expect from a non-inverting amplifier is that I'm gonna get a 10 volt amplitude out because again, this factor in the parentheses is a factor of two. And the, the oscilloscope function in Tinkercad isn't great. It doesn't give you an automatic amplitude measurement or anything, but I can see that the full scale of the Y axis here is 20 volts top to bottom. And my amplitude is exactly half that. So I am getting an output amplitude of 10 volts. So my non-inverting amplifier is working correctly. And as I mentioned earlier, it's very important to make sure your op amp isn't upside down. Pay attention to either the little notch or the dot and that you're not off by one row. So for example, let's see what happens if we flip this 180 degrees. I think I just sort of kill Tinkercad here. The simulation freezes and doesn't really know what to do. But if you're working with a physical op amp and you get it upside down like that, it's very easy to burn things out. So look out for that. And if you smell smoke or actually see the op amp crack or see a spark or anything, then you may have killed it and you're gonna need to carefully double check your wiring and hope you have some extra op amps around. Okay, that's it for this video on op amps. In our next video, we will tackle a new type of integrated circuit called an H-bridge. And we will also connect things up to a microcontroller using the Arduino.